Good morning, everybody, and it's, it's so great to see such a wonderful turnout for this uh, very important topic. Our grand round speaker is Dr. Jeremy Venistra Vanderweel. Um, Jeremy, I found out, was actually born in Canada, um, and he graduated from Harvard in 1996, where he uh, got his degree in psychology. He graduated from the University of Chicago Pritzer School of Medicine in 2004, and then um, subsequently had training at the University of Chicago in child and adolescent psychiatry. He also completed a neurogenomics fellowship uh, at the Vanderbilt Center for Molecular Neuroscience in 2009. He, I first met him uh, when he was on the faculty at Vanderbilt from whence I came. Um, through 2006 to 2014, he rose from being a clinical instructor all the way to an associate professor. And in 2000, uh, late 2014, he became um, a uh, associate professor um, at the uh, Sackler Institute for Developmental Psychobiology, and he's the director of developmental neurogenetics there. Jeremy has received numerous, numerous awards, uh, both grants as well as awards themselves for his research, and has been an invited national and international speaker. It, it'd be, I'd be, we'd be here all day if we listed all of those. He sat on NIH study sections and is on uh, numerous editorial boards. He has 57 peer-reviewed uh, research publications. And Jeremy um, uses molecular and translational neuroscience tools in the pursuit of new treatments for autism spectrum disorders, which he'll talk to us about today, and pediatric obsessive compulsive disorder, of which he's considered to be one of the uh, specialists in the field of autism in that. His molecular lab focuses on serotonin, oxytocin, and glutamate systems in genetic mouse models of ASD and OCD. So Jeremy, thank you so much for coming, and welcome. privilege to come. It still feels like coming up here. Uh, <laughs> driving from Nashville to Chicago, we always used to stop off in Louisville and have uh, lunch at a lovely little uh, French cafe uh, downtown or near the highway. I don't remember anymore. But um, it's great to hear about the work happening here in the Autism Center. Uh, people like Dr. Barnes and Dr. Lohr um, now seeing folks throughout the state, some of whom used to drive down to, to see me uh, at Vanderbilt. Um, but really taking a different approach, uh, I think, than what people have been able to access, uh, frankly, in several states around here, but certainly in Kentucky as well. So it's really nice to hear that and inspiring. Um, I'm going to uh, give a talk that is forward-looking, um, and so I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about current treatments, but spend most of the time talking about how we get from where we are to where we would like to be. Uh, that means that I won't have all the answers. I'm going to use a number of examples. Um, but uh, please see that as hopeful, even though I'm going to also uh, articulate some of the challenges. I think it's important to note uh, a number of disclosures. And when these are relevant, I'll put them up in red. Seaside Therapeutics, Roche Pharmaceuticals, and Novartis are companies that I've had research funding from. Um, and in the case of Roche and Novartis, have done some consulting with. None of that work has led to a medication that's on mark at, that's marketed. So uh, you can't prescribe anything that I've talked with them or worked with them on. Um, the other thing is, um, this is a picture of some of the folks who've been in my lab. Um, but I'm going to summarize a, a bunch of work that's been done by many, many different people. Um, and uh, I'll use words like we to, to describe this. But please realize that this isn't work that, uh, that I've done with my own hands, just working on my own. Uh, so I will very briefly describe uh, the challenge of heterogeneity in autism and, and sort of what we know um, from a very broad perspective about genetics, and then talk again very briefly about current treatments before talking about paths forward. Ultimately, we are not seeking a medicine that uh, magically cures autism. Um, what we're much more likely to find are medicines that 
together with behavioral therapies, uh, lead to significant improvements. That's what we're hoping for. Um, we could talk later about the difference between cure and treatment and how we should really think about uh, treatment uh, in a disorder that is a broad spectrum. Um, that's certainly a challenge. So I'm going to start by talking about how I think about children with autism spectrum disorder who come in to see me. Um, and this is one representation of that thought process where you see core symptoms in the center, and obviously, in order to know that a child has an autism spectrum disorder, you have to think about core symptoms. So really, now with the DSM-5, we're talking about impaired social communication, um, and we're talking about uh, restricted and repetitive behavior, including sensory-related behavior. Uh, and you have to obviously have all of these social communication difficulties and two out of the four restricted repetitive behavior domain difficulties in order to have a diagnosis. But I've yet to see a child who walks in and only has autism spectrum disorder. What you find instead is that a child will also present, say, with uh, language impairment or delay, intellectual disability very frequently. Oftentimes they also walk in with behavioral difficulties that may or may not be uh, worthy of a separate diagnosis, but are certainly things to address. And then always we have to think about medical comorbidities that may be the explanation for the current behavioral difficulties um, and certainly are things that if we treat them will make their lives better. Um, so that's what we look at clinically typically. In increasingly, children are also either walking in or receiving a genetic diagnosis uh, in the context of their autism spectrum disorder. And these can either be uh, things that they walk in with like fragile X syndrome and then they also have uh, behavioral difficulties consistent with autism spectrum disorder, or they can be things that, frankly, we can't identify based on uh, criteria other than a genetic test. Uh, every child with autism spectrum disorder should be tested for fragile X syndrome and should receive a chromosomal microarray. In a couple of years, we're going to say that every child should have their entire exome and perhaps genome sequenced. And then there are a number of biomarkers that have primarily been used uh, in research that are depicted here that we hope will sometime in the next few years walk into the clinical realm and will inform what we do in treatment, but they haven't yet. So we may have a child that walks in with this pattern, which could be consistent with fragile X syndrome um, that I'll use as one of the examples today. A child who walks in with this pattern, which may be consistent with this subgroup with hyperserotonemia that I'll talk about some as an example today. We take this child, this child, and 100 other kids with different patterns, we put them in a common treatment study and so, say that we have a treatment for autism. Um, I think it's pretty clear that isn't the ideal way to go about things, but right now we don't yet know how to sort better. If we reduce that to just thinking about genetic risk, um, and to a limited extent now we have some environmental factors we can add to this model as well, uh, we still have a lot of data in epidemiologic studies, twin studies, family studies, to suggest that in most individuals with autism spectrum disorder, there are multiple relatively common genetic risk variants, plus minus some environmental risk variants that are similarly uh, common, that sum up together to lead to autism risk in an individual. And so you may have somebody who has four of these risk factors, or maybe it's 20 of these risk factors who has some traits, and then somebody who has one more who has an autism spectrum disorder. That's the model, but we've had a really hard time identifying things that fit in that relatively common category. Instead, what investigators are finding over and over again are these really quite rare uh, genetic variants or environmental risk factors that by themselves contribute the majority of risk for an individual. So the most common of those is fragile X syndrome, which hovers between 1 and 2% of the ASD population. We have others that you can't necessarily identify based on medical features, dysmorphology, the appearance of a child, um, things like maternal chromosome 15Q duplication syndrome um, that you will only find out about by sending a chromosomal microarray in a child. And then we have other syndromes like tuberous sclerosis and P10 hamartoma syndrome where the majority of the difficulty um, that we think about, particularly early in life, tends to be medical. Um, but it's increasingly clear that these syndromes also include autism spectrum disorder as a frequent uh, comorbidity. And then we have a number of other things that are emerging over time. Some of these are quote unquote relatively common, like 1% of the ASD population, and others of them have really only been described in less than 20 individuals in the world. Um, so each of these rare things contributes what seems like a substantial amount of risk, but makes it really difficult to think about carrying out treatment studies in such a small population. As these emerge, we can 
uh, hope that we also get some environmental signals that are meaningful. And one of these is uh, exposure to valproic acid during pregnancy, which is a major risk factor for autism spectrum disorder, as well as any number of other developmental difficulties. And we hope that some of these will cluster. So tubular, tuberous sclerosis and P10 hamartoma syndrome that I'll talk about briefly do cluster. They affect the same pathway. We would then hope, in turn, that if you look in the broader ASD population, you'll find some folks who could benefit from treatments targeting that pathway. This is a complete unknown at this point. So starting here, it's already very complicated, but it only gets worse. So genetics, in a lot of ways, is the simplest end of things. You really have to walk from genes to proteins, where there's an expansion in variability, to protein networks, to time points in development, which is an uncertainty. It's a little hard to say where to put that. Cells, synapses, brain regions, circuits, behavior. Um, and this is obviously very complicated. If you have a single genetic variant, obviously you have uh, affected uh, or, uh, behavior affected in multiple domains. Sometimes you also see cognitive difficulties related to the same variant. And if you're looking for convergence, well, you can hope because you're looking at people with the same disorder that you see convergence up here. But there may be significant divergence further down. In order to develop treatments, what we'd like is to look for points of convergence that are relatively close to the behavior. But you can also imagine that when we're doing that, we've got this big, big black box covering what's actually leading to those difficulties. And we've yet to really surpass that. Um, I'll give examples that show you where we are in different uh, of these rare conditions, as well as in the disorder as a whole. Uh, in turn, we might have opportunities to treat at the level of protein networks much lower down. Um, or maybe we can identify both a protein network and a time point in development where it's important. But then our black box tends to be higher up, and we don't necessarily know how that's going to connect to behavior um, and which behaviors to look at in relation to which protein networks. The other complication is that we don't just have a bunch of these rare things um, that lead to autism risk in a fairly predictable way. But in many cases, we have reciprocal variation at the same locus. So here, um, we could have disruption of MECP2, which leads to Rett syndrome. We can have duplication of the same gene region uh, and actually also have developmental difficulties, including a risk of autism spectrum disorder. So you can have too much or too little, uh, much like Goldilocks. right? So if the oatmeal of brain development is too hot or too cold, it doesn't con uh, continue the way that we would like. This has emerged over and over again. It isn't always that you get autism on both sides, but very frequently you get a developmental disorder with either a duplication or a deletion in the same region. Um, and that means that if we're thinking about risk, we may actually in some cases be on opposite sides. And you could still have points of convergence, um, but you may have some individuals for whom a treatment would push this person closer to typical development and would actually make this individual much worse. So this model, where we develop medicines based on these quite rare variants, is what's increasingly termed personalized or precision medicine, sometimes individualized medicine. Um, and it really is the model, the primary model, for how we're walking forward. But I think it's useful to think about where our current knowledge is. Um, so our current knowledge is, like, is primarily in the domain of symptomatic treatments. So uh, one of these is the, the thing I can usually do most quickly to improve the life of a child with autism spectrum disorder when they come in to see me. So this is a really common problem in kids with ASD. And if you treat their constipation, oftentimes they're less irritable. Um, and that can make their lives much better, as it would for any of us. Epilepsy is another one that Dr. Barnes is going to focus on. I think that's clearly important. And then any number of behavioral domains where we have treatments that target uh, individual symptoms. Um, usually adapted from other areas in psychiatry, for the most part, uh, as well as neurology in the case of tics and stereotypes. Um, and then we have things like sociability, where many of us think about uh, lack of interest in other people as a feature of autism spectrum disorder. It turns out that that's only present in either a large minority or uh, a small majority of individuals. Some individuals with autism spectrum disorder uh, interact with others too much or in an, in an inappropriate way, in which case improving sociability or pushing toward more social interaction is not going to lead to an improvement. Whereas others may benefit substantially if we give them something that is going to make them more interested in others. And we'll talk a little bit about that example in the case of oxytocin. So I would say in the case of treatments that 
may benefit the majority of individuals, usually not all. Um, they're likely to be focused on symptoms and not on the pathophysiology, not on the underlying causes, at least not in the near term. If you're targeting a universal system or circuit that has a conserved function across all humans, you may be able to make a substantial impact, but these are certainly not the things that sometimes families um, and frankly, many times us as clinical providers are looking for as transformational treatments or cures. So I'm going to talk currently about the evidence for current treatments. Um, this comes in the context uh, of work done while I was at Vanderbilt as part of the Vanderbilt Evidence-Based Practice Center. Um, and I want to be clear that this is an evaluation of the degree of evidence, not the degree of benefit. So when I say something has strong evidence, that means we have a lot of data to suggest that it works. Not that it works to a huge degree, but that it works, okay? Um, so we have uh, a lot of evidence for a number of behavioral interventions, one in, in particular, or one group in particular. Um, and I'm only going to devote one slide to this. This is the least amount of time I'm giving to any treatment in this presentation, but it's where most children with ASD should be spending most of their time, okay? Um, where that evidence is is primarily for early and intensive behavioral interventions. These are either based on the LOVAS model, which is an intensive behavioral treatment model in a typical uh, behavioral setting, or the Early Start Denver model, which is a uh, sort of more adapted, uh, perhaps more developmental or relational approach. The strength of evidence here is moderate, but it's really the evidence that's the most hopeful. What seems to improve is adaptive behavior and cognition measured by IQ. And we could talk after about what that really means. There is evidence for some other interventions. These are likely um, things that work particularly in higher functioning kids um, and things that typically target one symptom domain or another. That's all I'm going to say about the behavioral domain, even though it's incredibly important. Um, on the medication side, I think this is where we have some uh, guidance for what we might do moving forward. And it's perhaps instructive to think about where we have the most data in autism spectrum disorder to date. Does anyone know who hasn't already looked ahead in the slides um, what the best studied medication in autism spectrum disorder is? I hear a lot of whispering of risperidone, which means both you guys are shy and you guys say what most people would say, which is that there is a lot of data for risperidone. It turns out that the best studied medicine uh, is secretin. Um, so this was uh, initially described in a case series of kids who improved after, uh, during an ER or after an ERCP where they received an infusion of uh, secretin. Um, and then studied in several randomized controlled trials that were all quite well done. It does absolutely nothing except put the child through the stress uh, and the pain of receiving a secretin infusion. It's instructive both because we now know that the placebo effect is really quite powerful in children with autism spectrum disorder, particularly for developmental outcomes, because even if you have a neurodevelopmental disorder, you continue to develop. And if you're asking whether somebody is improving, well, they're going to improve. It's very difficult to differentiate that improvement from the improvement that's related to a medication. The other thing that we need to learn is that things that work in small groups of kids or seem to probably are not going to hold up when we do a large randomized controlled study. And we need to hesitate before we have adequate data to actually treat children. So where most of the positive evidence is is for the atypical antipsychotic medications, which are in the broad class that was initially termed major tranquilizers. And frankly, that's what they do in autism spectrum disorder in the same way that they would do that in you or I. That if a child is having a lot of difficulty with irritability, agitation, aggression, that is very disruptive uh, to their ability to learn um, or disruptive to their ability to remain in setting, uh, if they're hurting people, if they're at risk of hurting themselves, these medicines are calming and allow a child a chance to benefit from their other interventions. Um, they need to be used in that context. They may benefit some other symptoms, but there isn't direct evidence that's quite strong for that. And then obviously there are very significant side effects associated with these medicines, such that we need to re reserve them for those situations where it's really urgent and they're really necessary. And that's it for having really strong strength of evidence for medicine. There is uh, evidence for actually most of the medicines that treat attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Um, as medicines that could be adapted to treat ADHD symptoms and autism spectrum disorder. With the DSM-5, we actually can make a co-occurring diagnosis here. That's a reasonable approach to take. Um, and I would say that approach is reasonable whether you're talking about ADHD or depression or, or what have you as being a reasonable approach, but where we have evidence, um, not so much. Uh, in a, uh, for ADHD symptoms, there's low strength of evidence for methylphenidate. Um, 
There is now some unpublished evidence in favor of the use of guanfacine as well and atavoxetine as well, roughly equivalent for, as the, uh, to the evidence for methylphenidate. Um, but each one of them works less well and has more side effects than in the general ADHD population. And then there's some quite mixed evidence for serotonin reuptake inhibitors that I'm happy to talk about after. Uh, essentially, we don't know if they're helpful for uh, children. They've never really been studied for anxiety-related symptoms in children. We know that they are helpful in adults, specifically for obsessive-compulsive disorder-like symptoms. That's all I'm going to say about current treatments. And now I'm going to move forward to thinking about how we get from what we know now uh, to really what we'd like to know. Um, and the first example is moving from these rare genetic disorders to molecular targets. This is what is usually termed precision medicine. Um, and there's been a huge push for this. Uh, we're making a tremendous amount of progress. Um, I'm going to use the example of Fragile X syndrome because it's really where we have the most knowledge, but there are any number of these uh, where you can walk through a story uh, that's developed to, to a greater or lesser extent. So uh, Fragile X syndrome, which is probably familiar to most of you, I'm just going to remind you of a few features. So obviously this is an X-linked recessive disorder. Um, mild to moderate intellectual disability, and this is really the primary thing that we think about, at least from a cognitive or behavioral perspective, that everyone with Fragile X syndrome has intellectual disability, um, at least using the typical definition. Autism, by our old definition, seems to be present around 30%. With the new autism spectrum disorder definition, we're not sure, um, but it may rise as high as 60%. Um, but most individuals have some level of social impairment, regardless of whether they meet criteria for ASD. Um, most children with Fragile X also have hyperactivity and impulsivity. And then there are a number of other features, including a characteristic appearance that many people describe as obvious, but to me they sort of look like family members, that they have large ears, a prominent jaw, a prominent forehead. You're not supposed to laugh so much. Um, so um, the genetics here has been worked out for more than two decades, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I'm going to present one of the prevailing models for what happens. Um, so there's a, an expanding trinucleotide repeat in the 5' prime untranslated region that when it gets to more than 200 repeats leads to gene silencing by hypermethylation. The corresponding protein binds to uh, mRNA um, and seems to shuttle it from the nucleus uh, out to a number of places in the cell, including dendritic spines. And that's really the site of the prevailing theory about what goes wrong, at least from a cognitive perspective, in Fragile X syndrome, which is this mglu 5 or mglu uh, uh, receptor group one, uh, receptor hypothesis. And this is largely from work in Mark Baer's lab um, that I'm going to summarize in a brief cartoon describing more than a decade of work. Um, so the idea here is that if this is your presynaptic neuron releasing glutamate, um, typically we think of that in terms of a ligand-gated ion channel, the AMPA receptor, um, that then leads to, to firing of the postsynaptic neuron. Um, that makes sense. You can think of that as the gas. Um, but also there's this other receptor that's a G-protein coupled receptor, the mglu 5 receptor, um, that acts sort of like the brake on that system. Um, and when stimulated, leads to removal of the AMPA receptor from a recirculating pool, so less AMPA receptor available to be stimulated. Um, and then because uh, cells have to have many uh, checks and balances, it turns out that the Fragile X protein acts sort of like a release on that break so that you don't get too much tuning down of that synapse, um, and you don't get too much removal of the AMPA receptor from the recirculating pool. If you don't have that protein, in the case of Fragile X syndrome, you get too much of this AMPA receptor internalized, too little of it available for glutamate signaling, and you fail to achieve adequate signaling to develop a mature synapse. In that case, you will not see suppression of neighboring dendritic spines. So uh, think of these dendritic spines as like antennas reaching out, trying to achieve a connection. When a connection happens, you don't need so many of the antennae, um, and they, uh, they have a less mature appearance. And that's exactly what's seen both in the mouse model of Fragile X syndrome, which now has been around for two decades, um, as well as in human neuropathology specimens. And at least from the dendrite perspective, the tissue cannot be differentiated. This could be a figure from either the mouse uh, or the human. And you see in uh, the Fragile X model, you, you see too many of these dendritic spines, and they have an immature appearance. They're too thin and too long, whereas here you see the typical appearance. Mice that model Fragile X syndrome do not show well-discerned dis well social deficits and actually have very minor changes in cognition. So from a behavioral perspective, they're not a great model. But from a brain perspective, they show a beautiful parallel and are probably useful. 
Um, they also show inducible seizures, so that's something that um, models the seizures that are seen in some folks with uh, fragile X syndrome, and they show hyperactivity, which is the easiest behavioral readout. So in mice, in a way that isn't true in humans, uh, genetic rescue is a fairly straightforward thing to do. Uh, you essentially decrease by half the amount of expression of whatever you feel like, and in this case, Mark Baer's lab decreased by half the expression of this mglu 5 receptor, thereby decreasing downstream signaling because you have less receptor present, increasing AMPA on the cell surface, um, and that led to what looks like a near complete uh, rescue, certainly from the perspective of dendritic spines, but also from the perspective of behavior, hyperactivity, improvement in learning as measured by ocular dominance plasticity, uh, which is adjustment after you sew one eye shut, obviously not something we can measure easily in a human, um, and complete resolution of the inducible seizure. So profound rescue of what we see at the brain level and some uh, behavior and cognition as well. And that really is the furthest along that anyone is in developing along this cascade where you go from genetics all the way up to the level of synapse. We don't necessarily know the connection with behavior, and that's particularly challenging because this mouse doesn't have some of the behaviors that we'd like to see. Um, but certainly, if we're able to target at that point, you can imagine that you'd have a treatment that could be transformational, at least for some symptoms. Um, and this is work done uh, by Roche, and I've uh, consulted and talked with Roche about this, but I was not involved in this study, um, where they used a drug that they administered um, not as a, a complete antagonist, but as a negative allosteric modulator, tuning down response at this receptor. They administered it for a mouse shortly after uh, weaning, extending all the way to uh, sexual maturity. So obviously a long period of time in a human, uh, four weeks in a mouse. Um, they saw complete rescue of the dendritic spine changes, improvements in hyperactivity, some improvements in learning, quite subtle improvements in auditory sensitivity, which um, is a difficulty for some folks with fragile X syndrome, decreases in seizures, um, and perhaps most importantly, no obvious ill effects on health. So based on that, you want to carry this forward into humans, and that um, now has been tested, but unfortunately, uh, the initial tests, because of regulatory requirements, were done in adults and were done in adolescents to a lesser extent, and really showed no measurable benefit. Um, and uh, this has now been not published, but reported uh, in press releases that uh, Novartis and Roche, both of which had programs studying this, have closed their programs because they were unable to show benefit in adults or adolescents. Now, all of you are thinking, well, why in the world would you start in adults or adolescents if we're talking about a neurodevelopmental disorder? And the challenge is, in mice, they don't have to learn a lot. They don't have to learn to speak. Um, they have to learn where the food is. They live in these little things the size of a shoebox. And we're able to see dramatic improvements in adults treated with medicines like these. But obviously, that's less likely to be true in humans. And we may just not be hitting a window where we can measure improvement, or you may not see improvement once you're that far into development. There are also questions about whether these drugs are specific enough, selective enough, whether side effects could have interfered, whether the outcome measures are appropriate. In the mouse, we don't know the right outcome um, to measure from a behavioral perspective. Uh, we know that the brain changes are the way we, we'd like to see. So there are a lot of questions here that we can come back to at the end if people are interested. There are a number of other targets that you could think about in Fragile X syndrome. Um, so I don't mean to say that this is the only place you could think about targeting. Most of these are built around the same model. Some aren't. Um, and I expect that we'll continue to see work done in this area and that we will see not just clinical treatment studies emerging from uh, data that really points to the pathophysiology of Fragile X syndrome, but that in the next five or ten years that we will see treatments that lead to behavioral or cognitive benefits, which is tremendously exciting because if you had said ten years ago that that would happen, most people would have said, no, we're not really going to see that um, because this is a neurodevelopmental disorder because we see symptoms so very early. But I think it will happen, but it's not an easy process. Um, FMRP has many other roles, binds to many other RNAs other than the ones downstream of mglu 5 signaling. Um, so there are some challenges, and you're likely to see uh, medicines that benefit one domain but not another. Another example is uh, in the tuberous sclerosis and P10 hamartoma syndrome domain, and I'm not going to have time to go through this in a lot of detail. Um, but this is a protein network um, that includes uh, the uh, proteins involved in tuberous sclerosis as well as in P10 hamartoma syndrome, as well as in neurofibromatosis, all of which lead to disinhibition of signaling through mTOR. Um, and the details of that aren't that important, except that mTOR is named 
for being uh, the target of rapamycin, which is a drug that's actually available uh, for use. So in this context, there actually is something that you could target at the level of protein networks with a lot of uncertainty between here and there, um, but perhaps with uh, more of a convergent point in terms of the impact of these genetic variants. Um, and that work is now underway. Um, I'm not going to go through this slide in detail, but suffice it to say that there's data from a number of different mouse models uh, to suggest that uh, targeting mTOR signaling can lead to improvement, both at the level of uh, brain size, brain function, um, as well as at the level of behavior. Very exciting work, and there are now ongoing trials, including uh, trials led by Mustafa Sahin at uh, Boston Children's Hospital, looking specifically at social and cognitive endpoints in uh, children with tuberous sclerosis. So that's the precision medicine approach. In some ways, the opposite approach is to think about it from the top down, to think about what we know about circuitry, what we know about symptoms, and think about whether we can develop specific medicines uh, that target that without necessarily knowing pathophysiology. That's really this approach, where you're thinking about behavioral uh, domains and limited knowledge about circuits that may underlie them, um, but circuits that are likely to be universal as opposed to specific to a particular cause of autism. Um, that's what we'd like to say we have, but in truth, we have something that looks more like this. And this is actually how every, <laughs> sorry, this is actually how every psychotropic drug um, has emerged. None of them have been based on a theory or an understanding of what causes a particular disorder. All of them are based on chance observation and then iterative improvements on whatever drug seemed to have an improvement um, in a symptom domain, be it agitation, psychosis, depression, uh, ADHD. So symptomatic treatments are really the only thing that we have thus far in autism spectrum disorder. Certainly you wouldn't say that the atypical antipsychotics are specific for ASD. And I think it's reasonable to think about how we could move things forward in this domain as well. And I'm going to use here the example of oxytocin, um, both because it's uh, fairly well along in terms of studies in autism spectrum disorder, um, but also because it really sort of fits this model. We don't think it has any specific implication in ASD based on emerging data so far. Um, there's very inconsistent findings with regard to plasma oxytocin levels in ASD. There may be more knowledge that emerges there, and there's very inconsistent genetic data. So certainly it's not one of these rare risk factors that has a big impact. Um, but oxytocin is really important for social behavior across species. Uh, and in human studies, folks have shown that it changes uh, where a person uh, attends on a picture of a face, they're more likely to look at eyes, they're more likely to focus on emotion, rate emotion accurately. They're also more likely to trust somebody uh, who may be conning them. Um, so avoid getting oxytocin squirted up your nose um, before you go uh, buy a used car. <laughs> so apart from used car dealers and perhaps uh, smarmy people uh, using oxytocin uh, at bars, um, which uh, is another concern when you're thinking about trust, and I'll come to an example of that in a moment. Um, this has now been tested in a number of studies in autism spectrum disorder, largely in the laboratory setting. So this is one of the better examples where this is a cyber ball game. Uh, the participant is either throwing the ball to this individual that they think is an actual person who always returns the ball back. It's actually a computer. Um, this individual who throws the ball willy-nilly, or this individual who really uh, never returns the ball to the participant. Uh, most of us, and certainly those of us who like playing cyberball, will play catch with the individual who throws the ball back. It's certainly more interesting and socially rewarding. In the group of folks with high-functioning autism spectrum disorder studied here, um, you see that there's no preference for throwing the ball to the individual who returns it. Um, these individuals actually received a, a, a saline um, nasal spray uh, as a control. Um, and this group of individuals actually received uh, an intranasal administration of oxytocin. Uh, where you see that the, now they do show a significant preference for the individual who returns the ball to them. Um, this is obviously a one-time administration in, yes, a randomized double-blind fashion in a laboratory setting. Certainly improved performance on cyberball is not an outcome we're looking for in autism spectrum disorder. This is a study that actually got more attention uh, now a little more than a year ago out of Kevin Pelfrey's lab. They were actually looking for changes in behavior and didn't see any changes in behavior. Um, but they did see some changes in uh, brain activation as measured by bold signal. And what's shown here very briefly is uh, change uh, in bold signal when presented with a picture of eyes versus a picture of vehicles. Uh, and the difference uh, between the oxytocin administration and the saline administration 
where you see uh, enhanced signal, uh, including in re regions like the nucleus accumbens, uh, that are important for reward, uh, as well as a number of other regions that they point to as components of the social brain. And that's really exciting, but it's a very broad change. Uh, some people describe this as a brain that's lighting up like a Christmas tree. But it's exciting because it means that you can give a saline, a, a, an oxytocin nasal spray and actually change what's happening in the brain, and in separate studies, not the same study yet, uh, change behavior. Again, single dose administration in the laboratory setting. Um, so now, like Secretin, there are tens of thousands of children in this country with autism spectrum disorder who are receiving intranasal uh, oxytocin, although it may as well be saline, um, because it's bought from places like Amazon, where you can get this uh, pure oxytocin accelerator nasal spray. Um, if you're concerned about risk, you can also use a sublingual drop administration, which is obviously not something that we should be doing, right? This is another example of getting way ahead of the data. Um, we need much more data in order to recommend anything like this. Um, but it is also available um, as a way of enhancing romantic experience. What we really... What we really want is not to push something like this immediately from laboratory single dose administration to broad use. What we need now is large sample sizes to test what's being done right now by many providers and many children across the country. Um, sorry. Uh, and, and this real world testing needs to answer the acute versus chronic question, but also needs to evaluate if you see change in real world behavior, not just laboratory based behavior. There's one uh, trial that's been studied. It's a small sample size. It was in adolescence, and it really doesn't seem to show significant improvement over the course of an eight-week study. And there are now are several uh, longer-term studies underway, including work that I'm involved in. One question is whether this will work independently or whether you re really need to couple it with some level of teaching, uh, like a social skills intervention. So, those are the two broad approaches. And then I would say that we really need some way to converge so that we have treatments that benefit more than 1%, uh, but probably benefit less than the majority. Um, and that model, I'm going to give uh, an example that I wouldn't say is what we want, but an example of what we are probably going to find in many treatment studies in ASD, which is a, a study that we were involved in. Um, the company that sponsored it has now gone out of business. So this is not going to move forward into, uh, I don't think, an available treatment. But it was a study of arbaclofen, which is a GABA-B receptor agonist, um, looking at a number of endpoints that I'm not going to go through in a lot of detail. But one of them, uh, clinical global impression of severity, was right at the threshold of statistical significance after correction for all of the uh, named secondary measures in the study. Um, one question is, well, you know, did it hit on the primary measure, uh, which is a measure of uh, lethargy and social withdrawal? And it really didn't at all. These are the two groups. You see uh, same slope, really no evidence that you have a significant improvement uh, due to medication treatment. But then when you look at this clinical global impression of severity across visits, which is a much more general model, um, a general uh, uh, rating done by the provider seeing the individual of how severely ill they are at that point in time, you do see a separation between the groups that seems to emerge around week eight or so. When you zoom in and think about what that really means, uh, there are two, there's a complementary measure called clinical global impression of improvement, uh, where you ask the provider to say, are they better than they were when they first came in? And you see here that there is some difference in individuals who are rated a four, which means they're not at all improved. They're not changed, they're not worse, they're not better. And then if you look at this clinical global impression of severity, you're looking for degree of change from baseline, whether they've improved one point, whether they've improved two points, three points, four points. Um, and again, you see that there are fewer individuals who show no change. When you zoom in at those individuals with the largest degree of change, you see that's where all the signal is. That these are individuals who shift to severity measures. So these are kids who may come in uh, severely or profoundly ill and are exiting as moderately ill, which is the sort of change that we rarely see in the clinic. But this represents about 15% of the treated population. So it's a very small subset of the individuals who come into the study. So obviously, we can't conclude that this is a medicine that children should be taking. This is a secondary measure. It's right at that threshold of statistical significance. It needs replication. But what we need more than anything else is to understand who are these kids who benefit. Because we don't want to administer something to a whole population to get improvement in 10 or 15%. There's some hint 
that individuals with a higher IQ or better language may be more likely to improve in this study. Um, but what we're really looking for is something that will tell us at the level of a test that we can do in advance. So what would such a test be? Well, we'd be looking for a biomarker that's easily quantified, reliable, replicable. It doesn't have to be heritable or controlled by genetics. It doesn't have to have a clear uh, line separating one group from, from another, although that would be nice. It doesn't have to be connected to pathophysiology or even to um, necessarily changes with treatment. Um, but it would be nice to have something that would connect this precision medicine area where we have a treatment that has a significant effect, but in a tiny group of the population, maybe 1% of kids with ASD, um, versus symptomatic treatments, which may have a much smaller effect, but in a broader population. We'd like something that connects these groups to maybe identify that 15% that will show that level of significant improvement. There are a number of examples of potential biomarkers in ASD. I'm going to use one that's been around for a long time and that I've been involved in studying, which is elevated blood serotonin levels. Um, so this was first described in 1961 by my great-grand mentor. Um, if this is the normal range of whole blood serotonin levels in any of us, uh, in autism, at least in some studies, there appears to be a second peak um, where there are individuals uh, about 25 to 30 percent who have blood serotonin levels above the 95th percentile for the general population. Um, interestingly, those levels actually correlate inversely with plasma oxytocin levels, suggesting that you may be able to put mul multiple biomarkers together and suggesting this may be something to study in those uh, trials of oxytocin. The serotonin that's contained in the blood is contained almost entirely in platelets. It gets into the platelets via the serotonin transporter, which I'm going to focus on in a moment. The levels in the platelet are extremely heritable, 0.99. So this is a sort of heritability seen for things like height, but not usually for behavioral disorders. Um, and uh, these levels are associated with the serotonin transporter gene in males. In the autism population, in families with two or more affected males, and importantly, no affected females, you see a strong linkage signal right over the serotonin transporter gene. Um, because it, these linkage signals correspond to a brain re uh, large genomic region, it's a little hard to say that that's the serotonin transporter for sure. Um, but in those families with most evidence for linkage, Randy Blakely, Jim Sutcliffe, and colleagues identified a number of rare amino acid variants in the serotonin transporter. So these are the sorts of things that we can actually do something with to understand the underlying biology. Each of these variants leads to an increase in serotonin transporter function which you'd imagine would lead to more serotonin being sucked up into the platelet and perhaps a higher level of serotonin uh, in the blood as a result. I'm going to focus on one of these variants because it's the most common one. It's a subtle change, so a single uh, uh, methyl group added uh, to an amino acid, a glycine to alanine change. This is actually conserved throughout mammals as a glycine, but in chickens uh, you see an alanine um, and actually in other birds as well. It is overtransmitted in autism. Um, it's specifically associated with rigid compulsive symptoms and sensory aversion in the ASD population. I would say it's important to understand that this is not something that's only found in people with autism. It's also found in people who are perfectly healthy as far as we can tell, particularly in females. But it is something that we can take into model systems. And so that's what we did. We developed a mouse that is a knock-in uh, of this uh, particular variant. That mouse grows normally. It appears to be healthy. Um, they do recapitulate the biomarker, so they have elevated blood serotonin levels, uh, as shown here in the mutant animals, which are now going to be shown as AA for ala ala. Um, and if we think about this at the level of the blood, that's a good model for the biomarker, but really we're interested in what's happening in the brain. So if we look at the parallels, if you have increased serotonin transporter function in the blood, you would have increased serotonin in the platelet. If, in contrast, you've increased serotonin transporter function at the synapse, you should have increased serotonin that's sucked out of the synapse into the presynaptic neuron. Um, so it isn't simply a, a case of a direct parallel. Uh, if you look at clearance in the brain, and this is work done in collaboration with Lynn Dawes' lab, uh, where they dump serotonin in using a micropipette and then track its clearance with chronoamperometry, you can see that there is a more rapid clearance of serotonin in the mutant animals roughly a two-fold increase, which is more than what was seen in uh, the cell model system. But then obviously we want to see, is there a change in behavior? Because it's important to have a readout that tells you whether the same systems are relevant in mice and in humans. And obviously mouse social behavior is quite different from humans. So this is one of the early uh, communication uh, tests that can be done where you separate the pup 
from the dam uh, at the seventh postnatal day and look at the degree of vocalizations that actually can be measured in, in terms of function to return the dam uh, to the nest. And you see that the mutant animals vocalize a lot less than the wild type animals, obviously not a direct parallel to autism. And then this is another assay that has a very easy to interpret uh, readout. It's like a McDonald's Playland assay. Two mice meet in a tube and one of them backs out. Much more naturalistic actually for mouse social behavior. You almost never see two mice together in your kitchen. Um, and that's because mice don't have social interactions in the open. Uh, whereas in a tube, you, you see no aggression in this context. They uh, have a brief social interaction, usually no touching, and one of them makes a judgment and backs out. The other goes out forward. And we see the mutant animals back out way more commonly uh, than the wild type animals. Um, again, not a parallel to what we might do for autism diagnosis, but tells us that this domain, uh, the social domain, does uh, show alterations. And then we'd like to understand how that impacts not just the serotonin transporters function, um, but how that in influences the serotonin system more broadly. Um, and this is uh, one way to do that, which is to look at serotonin receptor function. In the wild type of animal, you'd expect uh, to see uh, a level of serotonin outside the, uh, the cell that's greater than in the mutant animal. If the receptor is seeing less serotonin, uh, you actually see that it increases its sensitivity to serotonin. Um, and we can make use of that by giving a serotonin receptor agonist that in this case leads to a drop in body temperature. And you see that that drop is much more steep in the uh, mutant animal versus the wild type animal, uh, suggesting that you do indeed see this change in receptor sensitivity. So then the question is, where do we intervene? And I'm sort of stopping the story at this point. We have work that's ongoing uh, to look to see if we can change serotonin transporter function by uh, manipulating its regulation with uh, small molecules. But you could also intervene at any number of serotonin receptors that could lead to changes in, uh, in function of any number of behaviors, including social behavior. And I'll talk about one of those examples in a second. But the other question is when to intervene. So it turns out that the serotonin system becomes active very early in embryonic development in both mice and in humans and is expressed in humans only in serotonergic, or the serotonin transporters expressed in humans only in serotonergic neurons. But in mice, actually, it's expressed in a broader array of neurons, including uh, in the thalamus, where the serotonin transporter modulates projection uh, to the sensory cortex, which could be quite relevant to that sensory aversion phenotype that's associated with this allele. And we're continuing to follow that up. If you think about immediate translational potential, there actually is a drug, buspirone, that is a serotonin 1A agonist. It also is a quite dirty drug. It hits any number of other receptors that is currently in a clinical trial um, to assess whether it leads to benefit in humans. In rats, it does increase social interaction at lower doses that than what we used in this study. Uh, and you might wonder what would happen with chronic administration, whether you actually could uh, normalize signaling at that receptor in some way and lead to improvement. Now, critically, you don't want to do this in the whole population. You'd want to do this in individuals where the serotonin system is implicated. And that's what's been missing from most of these sorts of studies. Nobody's actually looked at the biomarker when they're looking at a serotonin reuptake inhibitor or in this study as well, to my knowledge. So I've walked you through these different approaches and hopefully something that can be an in-between approach. Um, but ultimately, what we'd like is something like what was attempted in this study which added behavioral treatment to treatment with risperidone. So both groups here are getting risperidone. On the y-axis, you see uh, change, or you see the level of uh, severity for disruptive behavior. And on the x-axis, you see time and treatment. Both groups are getting risperidone and show obviously a steep improvement uh, in behavior during treatment. The group that's receiving additional behavioral treatment here shown in blue does show a statistically significant improvement over the group that's not, but it's a very small effect size. And at six months uh, in follow-up, they saw that there was no longer any difference. Now, that's a challenge, um, and a challenge in study design, because it turns out that the group that was receiving no behavioral treatment was receiving a higher dose of risperidone. Their physicians kept dialing the medicine up, whereas the group in behavioral treatment received a lower dose, suggesting that there probably is a meaningful impact of behavioral treatment but illustrating one of the challenges of putting two things together. You really have to make sure, sure your doses are held steady. What we'd prefer to see is something a little bit more like the decycloserine story that may be um, familiar to some of you, but has emerged uh, initially in literature in the rat and then moving into multiple anxiety disorders, where you see that if you take decycloserine, which is a, a partial 
uh, agonists at the NMDA receptor, different glutamate receptor, um, you're able to see a potentiation of extinction learning. So this means that if I'm being desensitized to my fear of heights, I will be desensitized more quickly, which has been seen in one of these studies. This is an example from obsessive compulsive disorder where you see a much more rapid rate of improvement early in treatment. And you can imagine that if you put something like this together with a behavioral treatment, safer disruptive behavior in autism, that you could have outcomes that are a significant improvement, especially given how much behavioral treatment is used in ASD. So this is my overview. I would say that there is considerable reason for hope. Um, there are many other things that are, that are currently in active studies. These are, these are just some examples. Um, I think that we are going to see precision medicine pay out. To what degree that extends to the general population, I don't know yet. But I certainly hope it benefits more than just, say, individuals with fragile X syndrome, that there's a larger group that may benefit from the same treatments, but that we're really going to need biomarkers to figure out who those folks are, and that ultimately we need to work together. Um, and that's one of the things that I like about uh, learning about the, the Louisville Autism Center, that there really is an effort here to put people together to have a true multidisciplinary approach so that children are able to benefit from synergistic treatments. These are some of the acknowledgments on the clinical side um, and then uh, also on the molecular side. Um, I want to highlight in particular uh, Randy Blakely, who was my mentor during my postdoc at Vanderbilt, Jim Sutcliffe, who did much of the genetic work that I told you about in the serotonin system, as well as any number of folks uh, at Vanderbilt, including the Evidence-Based Practice Center um, and the team involved in cr clinical trials uh, on my side. So thank you very much for your attention. I know it's a whirlwind tour, um, but I'm happy to pause and take some questions. <laughs>